everybody. This is Jason Augustus Newcomb. We're inside the Magic Circle today. My guest is Jason Mankey. He is a fascinating gentleman who has um, been practicing witchcraft largely in the Gardnerian tradition for several decades. He has written seven books for Llewellyn, which is quite an accomplishment, although I do think they kind of once you have a good one, they, they kind of, you know, keep telling you to write another one. So, uh, <laughs> but he's, he's, uh, he's also running two covens in the Bay Area of California. He's a very cool guy. I met him uh, a number of years ago at a festival and we were rooming together and he gave me the distinct pleasure that I got to be called, oh, the other Jason, the whole, the whole thing, because he was more, um, noted than I was, so everyone <laughs> put, him, put him as Jason one and I was Jason two, um, so, but that's, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I was glad, glad to just be Jason, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, so Jason, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, it's great to see you again. Uh, yeah. 2017, I think, was the time the last we, time we saw each other? The first did time, you, yeah. How, how did my rambling introduction go? I liked it, it was okay. fun, <laughs> good. I'm often the other Jason, you know, because for no, a while I mean, there was, there was we Jason all... Pitzelwaters oh, at the sure. Wild Hunt. Yeah. And he, people used to get him and I confused a lot, though we looked nothing alike. Yeah. And no, I don't think I don't think anyone confused you or I um, in the in the event, but just sort of like we're like, oh, I was hoping it was going to be Mankey instead of Nuke. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, let's let's start at the beginning here. Uh, you've been practicing witchcraft for a super long time. Um, and you're initiated in Gardnerian witchcraft. Did, is that was that the first exposure to witchcraft that you had, or did was that something that you decided upon later in your in your life? Uh, guard was later. I mean, uh, as most kids of Generation X do, you know, you kind of start out on your own, reading mm -hmm. books, practiced as a solitary for a few years. Then I moved to Michigan, and I started running around with the student group at Michigan State University. But it was all very just a kind of eclectic Wiccan style witchcraft for a long time. My wife and I decided that we wanted to do something more serious. And so we started practicing or studying with a Gardnerian coven about a, an hour from our house. And we, because we had friends in that coven, they eventually became third degrees and told us that they wanted us to be their first initiates. And so that was in 2010 when we were initiated into Gardnerian craft. So out of wow. all of my years of witchcraft, guard has been about a third of it, probably. Mm -hmm. Maybe and, uh, and how do you feel about the decision to join the Gardnerian system? Do you feel like it, it elevated things for you or? Oh, absolutely. It, yeah. was a, it was a big step. I think, especially today, it's like really popular to kind of hate on Wicca. You know, mm -hmm. like there's a lot of Wicca bashing in social media. It's like, what sure. you do isn't serious at all. And, you know, it's all fluffy buddy, blah, blah, blah. And I think Gardnerian craft, the initiatory paths are much more involved. I think there's a little more meat on the bone to them. Uh, it's also nice tapping into that energy. Sure. Of something that's been practiced for at least several decades, because I feel like when you're in a Gardnerian circle, you're tapping into the energy of Gerald Gardner or Doreen Valiente mm -hmm. and all the other Gardnerians who came before you. And I really like that and still have an eclectic coven and I love eclectic Wicca too, but you know, I think our heart is really in the Gardnerian stuff more so. So you have, you have one coven that's Gardnerian and one coven that's, uh, that's eclectic Wicca? Yes. Well, I need a Petri dish for books. You know, <laughs> I, need, I need that space to do weird shit. And the eclectic coven gives me the space to do weird shit. And then we just have friends that we love doing ritual with who don't want to be Gardnerians. And that's sure. completely fine. And how different how different is the sort of uh, monthly Sabbath on on those two groups? I mean, it seems like there's sort of a formula for for witchcraft that a lot of people follow that I think Gardner kind of created in a way, or I'm sorry, received or what you know, however we want to look it's at fine. it all. But created uh, is fine. <laughs> um, the the. Uh, it seems like you know there there would be a certain amount of similarity at least between those. Is that wrong or? I I think there is. I mean, I think Gardner sort of created or revealed, you know, calling the four quarters, casting a circle, mm -hmm. invoking deity, doing some sort of seasonal working, cakes and ale, dismiss everything. You know, that's yeah. kind of the basic sort of Wiccan system, and I think that really comes from Gerald. But there yeah. are differences. I think our Sabbath celebrations, though, in the eclectic coven, are better because I write those rituals instead of the crappy ones Gerald wrote in 1953. 
so, so you know there is some real advantage to having the eclectic stuff on, on your monthly stuff do you, do you do you do a sort of like deity of the month kind of thing because i was involved in a in a coven that was doing that for a little while um you know sort of like this this month it's going to be diana this month it's going to be hikate is that sort you know, of not, the way? not really uh, we have some house deities mm -hmm. so the eclectic coven works a lot with Pan, Dionysus, Kernonos, Aradia, Bridget, Persephone, Demeter, and Aphrodite. So those are the kind of the deities that we probably call to the most, though there are others. And I think Guard, like most initiatory traditions, has just a couple of deities that are the focus of the mm -hmm. tradition. And those are the deities that you invoke in the tradition it's a you don't say the names of those deities outside of gardnerian or alexandrian circles or whatever it is those are for those are oath bound only sort of things but we don't and so in guard it's always the same deities which which coven gets precedence to, to be on the actual um you know moons and so forth <laughs> um rather rather than or do you switch it around none of them do uh because we always meet fridays and then mm -hmm. saturdays so you know whoever Oak Court, which is the eclectic, is Friday. The Gardnerian Coven is Saturday. Sometimes one wins, sometimes one loses, but we're all pretty busy, so it's hard to meet during the week. We have sure. people who drive at least an hour for the eclectic coven, two hours for the guard coven. So, you know, saying, hey, let's show up on Tuesday just doesn't seem feasible. So, so we what, save everything for the so weekend. If, if Friday and Saturday are eaten up by witchcraft, what, what nights are date night with you and the wife? Thursday? <laughs> okay. I mean, anyway. My wife does say things like, "God damn it, we have to do the the whole weekend is witchcraft." And like, yep, sometimes <laughs> it is. And then sometimes too, you get like an like an open circle that you have to do or something mm -hmm. too. So there's a third, even possibly a fourth one. Samhain especially, there's about six different rituals to go to. Sure. And she says, "How many times do I have to celebrate death in the next two weeks?" So, so let's let's take a step back um, from here and just uh, uh, how, how did you become interested in, in magic and, and witchcraft in the first place? You know, a couple of different uh, there are a couple of different stories, uh, but, but there's kind of three moments. When I was a kid, I really loved mythology, I really loved Greek mythology, read as much as I could. My, I was in second grade and my dad gave me his college textbooks on mythology and I was reading those. I mean, did I call Persephone Persephone? Yes, but I was reading the stories. And I remember uttering a prayer to Zeus in second grade once. Uh, fast forward to the summer between seventh and eighth grade. I checked out a book on witchcraft at a local library. Mm -hmm. It was a Sybil Leak book. Couldn't, uh, didn't read all of it. it probably was a little uh, too much for me and she's not a particularly great writer anyways. But I lost my other library books and my father was getting very impatient. So I went to the witchcraft book I cast my first spell to find a lost item and I found the other books like 10 seconds later. You would think that would have made me like a magic practitioner for life. Instead, right. it scared the shit out of me and I didn't think about witchcraft again for like six years. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and then I was 21 and I was a huge fan of Led Zeppelin. And I found this book called Celtic Magic by DJ Conway. Again, a terrible book. And I thought, though, that if I read it, I would learn more about Celtic mythology, which Robert Plant loved. Instead, it was a basically an eclectic Wicca 101 book with Celtic mm -hmm. deity names. And I found myself just instantly falling in love with the idea of Wiccan witchcraft. And that was really what brought me in. I remember reading it and then saying prayers to the goddess 48 hours later. So, uh, so this actually um, brings us to another subject um, that, that I, I like to ask people about just because there are a lot of different models and beliefs that people operate from, but it's kind of a difficult question for some people to answer. Um, and, and that is what, what are the gods and spirits to you? What, you know, what is the goddess to you? Is she, is she um, the creator of the universe? Is she the, you know, just give me your thoughts on this. It is a hard question. I mean, because I would call myself a polytheist, but I realize I'm a very soft polytheist. You know, I'm Pan is not Kernonos, for instance. Mm -hmm. To me, those two deities are very separate and very, very different. But I can't help but wonder if deities somehow are related on a more cosmic scale sometimes. That, 
deity is so much greater than us, it can do different things. And perhaps to express ideas that humanity needs, it takes forms like the horn god, which you know is part Kronos and part Pan and part Dionysus and part other things. So I think that the gods exist as separate beings, but I do think that there might be some energies and things that connect them to one another. So on an on a sort of an ontological level, you know, a, a hierarchy of creation, would you say the, the horned god then would be above Kernunos and Pan, or, or the horned god would be below Kernunos and Pan as a way that we have kind of put things together? I feel like I'm going to have to pour libations after answering that question, because... <laughs> I'm going to piss somebody off in the cosmic pantheon. I don't really know. Maybe the maybe the bigger ideas are a little more powerful or a little stronger than the individual deities. Well, I mean, I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately. And see, 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 I'm wondering if the the more Earth, the uh, closer to Earth deities are actually more powerful in their way than the cosmic deities, because the cosmic deities would really just they're just bringing stuff. They're, they're, they're bringing stuff to the, the closer deities who actually do the things, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the highest cosmic deity is just sort of, you know, a very simple thing, putting a simple thing in motion that becomes more and more complicated and more and more powerful as it rolls. So, I mean, and, and ultimately, if you ask something of the very highest deity, that's, that's a pretty lofty place to be going for something in the material world. So in horned god studies, okay. and this was a, a writer who wrote a book in the 60s about pan in literature, she talked about what she called the Orphic pan. Uh, to me, that's sort of like the cosmic pan, like the greater than everything pan mm -hmm. is the god of all or everything. And then she wrote about the rustic pan, which is the pan like outside your window splashing in a stream and chasing nymphs. Right. I the one, kind the of one grabbing a goat that, by the buttocks. I call it like the intimate pan. And I think that you're right. I think that as a human being, I have better relationships with the gods who are here, the gods with specific names. I don't know if that makes them stronger, but they're the ones that I go to and the ones that I interact with the most. And when we need something or we're blessed with something, we think it's the Pans and the Aphrodites and the Dionysuses, not the horned god or the great goddess or maiden mother crone or whatever else. It's those deities with specific names who have mythology from ancient times mm -hmm. who have been worshipped you know by a particular name for a couple thousand years i want to mention something that i failed to mention in the introduction which is that you currently have a book that has just hit some bookshelves and will be hitting more as, as we go called the horned god of the witches so this is a very appropriate topic for us to be talking about that i that i did not mention in, in the intro um forgive me and now it has been mentioned so hopefully you know the people who are still watching um after my rambling introduction <laughs> will be it was great will be appreciative of, of the, the fact that they can get this book so um so the the gods uh they're they're separate from you as um J jason mankey but are they separate from your sort of you know soul essence do you do you see us as being you know interconnected on a on a on a um spiritual level or we're all discrete from one another you know i think there have to there have to be connections you know it's like a web you know there it just kind of comes from the middle and kind of spans out it's very neoplatonist i think to think like that but i i think that we're all connected to something a little bit greater that does not mean that you know like pan is raging inside me or something but i do feel like the gods are a part of the earth and i'm a part of the earth so we're connected in that sort of sense in that way yeah. and so um you have you you have a, a a fairly organized um tradition in which you in which uh, multiple traditions in which you're working with these beings what um what sort of a, a temple space do you guys work out of we actually have a dedicated ritual room for what we do that wasn't we didn't start it that way but we live in a two and a half bedroom house and it's just my wife and i so we had kind of an extra bedroom and we decided we would turn it into the ritual room instead of trying to do ritual in the living room and it's where all of our magical stuff is and when we walk into that room we get shivers because it's just the energy just kind of flows around it all the time 
So our temple space is really important to us. It's important to our coven who all like leave items there and stuff. We've always tried to make it very clear that's not just a room in our house. It's everybody's space. It's the temple and, for the group. Yeah, it's, you know, it's their place too. And so on the walls, you know, we have pictures of all of us, not just things that Ari and I like. And we live in Northern California and you'd think, oh, California, they probably should go outside and do ritual and stuff. We live in an area that's super packed full of people. Yeah. There's no yeah. privacy. The, our backyard is exposed on one side to our neighbors. We don't really want to do ritual exposed like that. I, don't visit. worry, I have one at my feet too. And so be working inside is easier for us. And one of the things I like about having the temple space though is that it's charged all the time. I mean, you walk in there, even before you've said anything, chanted anything, cast a circle, there's already energy like rolling around that room. Sure, having so, a dedicated room can be really great. Yes. Don't rip down everything, Speedy. All right, so, um, and do you guys work in a circle or do you work in just an open room space? You know, it's technically an oval, I think. You know, we cast what we think of as a circle, but okay. the room is kind of narrow, so it becomes more of an oval depending on how many people are there. But we don't usually, you know, plot out the, the circle on the floor. Sometimes no. for initiations, like our eclectic coven is called the oak court, so we'll make a circle of oak leaves around to make it pretty. But for the most part, we don't really do a physical circle. Interesting. I, I feel like I'm one of the few kind of holdouts on, on using physical circles. I mean, I, I, you know, amongst the people who I've been speaking to anyway, I know, I know that there's lots of people out there using that, but uh, it, it seems like it's, it's not as, as popular with people. Um, although I think that there's like a psychic circle kind of culture within Wicca, right? That you sort of, you're, you're, you're making a, a circle with your um, energy and so forth as part of but the... To me, the circle that we cast is extremely important for what we do. It's a bridge between the worlds. It's an entryway to the realm of spirit. It's an entryway to the realm of deity and other higher powers. So being in that space is so important. One of the things about Gardner that made his circles different than others, you know, traditionally, if you're a magician, you cast a circle for protection, right? To keep out entities you didn't want to interact with in the circle. You know, you created a space so you could work with other things. And for Gardner, he created circles so that you could fill the circle with energy and then release it at a given point, which was, I think, kind of a new thing when he did that in the 1950s. So the circle itself is really essential to how we work magic by raising energy and then releasing it at a particular time. Well, I haven't, um, I haven't read that much of, of Gardner's material, but I, I do know that, that um, Crowley somewhat had that idea as as uh, present within his his system which of course he was at least a little bit of an influence on Gardner um, in, 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 <laughs> um and uh the the there the the sort of grimoireic tradition seems to be more about sort of keeping the things out whereas the golden dawn tradition I think really sort of had had that same principle in it. It may not have been stated super explicitly, but I mean, you would you set up an altar with a bunch of colorful things and stuff. Clearly, you're trying to, you know, bring something <laughs> into that space. Right. So um, let's talk a little bit about about Gardner and in, in history because you seem to have a very sort of. I mean, I, I know some witches who really don't like to think about the influence of Crowley upon um, modern witchcraft. Um, wh what's your take on that? Crowley was extremely influential, not as influential as some people like to say, like Crowley didn't write Gardner's Book of Shadows or anything, but Gardner plagiarized a lot of Crowley because he had access to the material and it sounded very witch-like, so he incorporated it into what he was doing. Though I think that Gardner saw the magical systems of Aleister Crowley and the Golden Dawn and probably thought that they were too complex to ever really become very popular. Right and sort of like what we do as Wiccan witches is sort of, I don't wanna say it's dumbed down, but it's a simplified version of much more involved high magical processes. But certainly Gardner was really influenced by Crowley, used a lot of Crowley's writings, especially in the 50s and 60s. It was really cool to say that you were influenced by Crowley. That was mm -hmm. a big deal. In Civil League's Diary of a Witch, she has this ridiculous, bit about her being four years old and 
Uncle Alistair coming over and like cupping her face and saying, you are the future of the witch cult. You know, like, first of all, you wouldn't want to leave your kids in a room alone with Alistair Crowley. Sure. And then, of course, he also wasn't a practicing witch. You know, it's just ridiculous. Hilarious, though. Uh, so in the 50s and 60s, people would play up some of those links to to Crowley uh, because Crowley was a kind of was a popular figure. So magical history is a big interest of yours, um, as well as the practice of it. Um, what do you what uh, how, what do you feel were the other influences on Gardner? I mean, you know, obviously there's there's the um, the Margaret Murray is that her name the the yeah. uh, the the witch cult um, ideas. But what where else was he pulling from? Was there a coven in in um, England that that you know the Pickingill or whatever is it is that a is that a factual thing? The Pickingill stuff's nonsense. That I don't okay. believe any of that. But, you know, Gardner says he was initiated in the area of England known as the New Forest in 1939. I think that he probably was initiated into something. There's a historian named Philip Heselton who's gone into the New Forest and unearthed the names of a lot of people and groups that were doing magical practices. And Gardner writes about some of them in his biography. The biography is attributed to Jack Braislin, who was a member of his coven, but it's really Gardner's story. And he wasn't, you know, it's, it's Gardner basically kind of what, overseeing a biography about himself. Uh, so was, there was the name of that book in, in, in case people are interested in it. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, it's kind of hard to get. It's out of print. Hmm. And, you know, every once in a while, someone will print up new ones, but you can probably find it as a PDF online or something. Gardner's family has no interest in his published materials. Interesting. So they're all pretty easy to get online. And, and what's the name of it? Uh, uh, Gerald Gardner Witch. That's okay. the name of the... So I'm sorry, I was interrupting you. You were talking about yeah. the historian who, who um, ha ha placed some of the names, with, you know, and, and the book that... that yeah, so, you know, there's... Philip Heselton goes to New Forest, finds people who were interested in magic. Some of them are named by Gardner. Um, or groups were named by Gardner in his biography. And yeah, I think he was initiated in 1939. Do I think it was complete? Do I think it went back hundreds or thousands of years? No, probably went back 10 years or something. Hmm. But it was really fragmentary. And when he went public with it in the late 40s, he added his own materials and tried to make a greater, more coherent tradition out of the little bit that he was given. The whole, the George Pickengill thing comes from some British magazines in the late 70s or the early 70s when someone was writing into them talking about how George Pickengill was the grand magister of a coven and that there's an old photograph of Aleister Crowley in this coven with Gerald Gardner. Right. Uh, the photograph obviously has never been seen and it's unlikely to exist because we know Crowley kept really detailed diaries his whole life and there's no mention of any of that. But it kind of became an urban legend that grew out of these magazine articles, which have no collaborating information at all, other and, than this guy writing letters. And there are a couple of books about the subject at this point. And do they just gather that same um, non non referenced material together? <laughs> yeah. Well, Michael Howard, who passed away, I think four or five years ago, he edited he edited a few Wiccan magazines. I think one of them was called The Wiccan, and then The Cauldron, some witch magazines. And he was the one who was publishing all these letters, and then he put them together in a capital band book called the Pick and Gill Papers. Right. And, you know, at first you read the Pick and Gill Papers, and you're like, yeah, maybe that makes sense, right? English cunning man, practice witchcraft, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they get more and more fanciful as you go along. The deeper you get into the letters, the, the bigger the story is. And, you know, it's really hard to keep something a secret. I mean, Gerald Gardner's sure. Book of Shadows was published for the first time in 1964. His corpse was barely cold when somebody, you know, first published his very secret Book of Shadows. It's hard to keep things a secret for a long time. And and uh, I, I I did read the Pick and Gill papers, you know, years and years and years ago, um, and I, I I I I walked away from it feeling pretty much what you're saying. Um, but what do you think the intent of the person who was doing that? Hello again. Um, the intent of the person who was doing that, were they trying to establish a tradition for themselves or was it sort of just a hoax like Holy Bud, Holy Grail? Or where, where, where did that come from? I think, it's, I think it's an attempt to establish a tradition. I think that we often look at traditions and don't think they're valid unless they're old. 
Sure. Right. So the further you can go back, the more valid the tradition is. George Pickengill had been written about in some paperbacks about English witches in the 1960s. And so his name was sort of in circulation. So it was easy to pick his name out and then sort of inject it back into the witchcraft conversation. But I, I think it's about legitimacy. And, but I mean, it doesn't seem to have had much of an impact on anything, so. It, it doesn't, but you know, I still see people who repeat the story an awful lot. Mm. And it every once in a while come up in a book, you know, like, well, Gerald Gardner was initiated by George Pickengill or something. And, you know, there's usually not a footnote or anything about it, but it's just one of those sort of like urban myths within witchcraft that just keeps getting retold. Are there a lot of people within your Gardnerian tradition that sort of try to um, dismiss or, or um, remove the, the fact that Crowley had a big influence on the original Book of Shadows? I don't think most of us care anymore. I think people care about Crowley um, in a concerned way at this point because his writing could be anti-Semitic, because it could be racist sometimes. I mean, Crowley was certainly far from a perfect human being. Sure. And, you know, there are people you know, who want to distance themselves from some of that. But I think it's pretty well known that go, like Crowley stuff is everywhere. And I well, think most of us are, you know, even if you don't like Crowley, are comfortable with it because it works within the context of what we're doing. Is it Doreen Valiente who was the, um, cause I, 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 th I thought I understood that she really was trying to like seriously remove his presence from the story entirely. She tried to edit out some of the borrowings from Crowley in the Book of Shadows. I mean, like today she's probably most famous for writing the charge of the goddess once in a month and better be when the moon mm -hmm. is full. There you shall uh, assemble in some secret place and adore the spirit of me who was queen of all the wise. I think that, you know, she, at, at that period during the early fifties, there was a lot of negative press about Crowley. Mm -hmm. And she thought that maybe it would like reflect badly on witches if people found out that some of the things that they were using came from Crowley. So she tried to get rid of some of it in a couple of places, but there's so much of it. That's <laughs> really hard yeah. to get rid of it all. Gerald Gardner wrote an early version of The Charge of the Goddess that used a lot more of Crowley's poetry. And when she redid The Charge of the Goddess, she took a lot of that out. It actually sure. makes for a better piece. The it way does. She did it. I mean, because the Crowley stuff, I don't, I don't dislike it, but it just, it, particularly since I'm familiar with the Crowley stuff, it seems jarring to have it in there. Um, and it's not as, I mean, it's, it's, frankly, it's, it just has a different tone than the other pieces of it. So um, let's, let's go back to you for a second, though. And, and um, how much does uh, sort of uh, visionary states, altered states, and, you know, sort of communing um, on a spiritual level with uh, um, deity and other entities as a part of the work that you do? I think mostly that my wife and I are deity focused. I think that's the most important thing that we do. I think what we do is a magical religion, but uh, because there's a religion aspect to it, we're very focused on deity. I think good ritual is very trance-like. Mm -hmm. It kind of takes your brain. And when you, you do ritual the same way, time after time after time, it, it's like going to a place almost instantly where you can feel and touch and hear the gods and be closer to them. So I'm not, I'm not a good meditator. I'm way too earthy. I'm a Capricorn, double Capricorn, uh, just not good at it. But when I do ritual, you know, we open with a little chant or something. And the moment we start singing that, I'm instantly in a different headspace. So that type of ritual as meditation is really important and connects me to deity. I think too, like we have devotional altars around the house and when we pour the gods wine or whiskey or whatever it is, we feel them there in that moment with us. But it, you know, I don't think I have to seek out altered states to feel them all the time. It, they're, they're here. Well, the, the reason that I mention altered states is, is, is mostly just uh, discussing the sort of the visionary state. And, and so, I mean, when you interact with deity, are, are there times when you're having a conversation back and forth with deity? I don't think it communicates like you and I communicate with words, but there are emotions and ideas that I can feel that I can mm -hmm. sense, you know, like kind of happens up here instead of with my ears. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that we communicate with one another. It's just sort of a different way of communicating. Every great once in a while, though, you know, there'll be a dream or something where we see one of a deity and have a conversation. And then, of course, as Wiccan witches, drawing down the moon is really important to our process. And when you draw down the moon, deity physically inhabits a human's body and will talk to you and hug you and things. Right. Uh, so I, you're I, really I wanted, that. Yeah, I wanted to address that um, as the next thing that I was coming to, which is, you know, in, in a lot of uh, Wicca and witchcraft traditions, there there is a there is a uh, sort of a possession phenomena that goes on as a as a significant portion of it. And how does that how does that play um, in your two different covens? And and how does that play for you in particular? In the eclectic coven, we don't do it very much. Oh, okay. Um, we kind of find it physically taxing to some degree, and it's not a parlor trick. And we, so it's not something that we want to do unless we think the ritual really calls for it. Mm -hmm. But there are times in the eclectic coven where we do that. I think is an essential part of gardenarian practice. Drawing down the moon. I, I think if you're in a gardenarian coven, it's probably something that that you do with some frequency. And so, um, so it's really important to what we do. Without um, getting into you know specific secret things, um, when when you are um, drawing the deity into yourself in that situation, um, do you, do you how, how does that change your perceptions? For me, if I've drawn down deity, I'm not there. I'm going to be told afterwards what was said, what was done. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when it's happening you can kind of see things that are going on, but you don't feel like you're in control of your actions. And when you see them, it's almost like looking up, like at the bottom of a skyscraper or something, and then seeing the top of it, you know, like you can see things, but it all feels so very far away, sure. right? Like you're just sort of removed from it. I know that when we do drawing down the moon and like my wife draws down the goddess or something, you know, the cadence of her voice changes how she walks changes, how she stands changes. The fire in her eyes is a different fire in her eyes. You know, everything about her changes. And this is somebody I've been with for, you know, almost 25 years. So I know her pretty well. And yeah. when you watch her completely change into a different person, you know that something is going on with that. And, and so when you, um, when you or somebody else is taking in a divine um, form, do you then ask them questions or, you know, is there like an oracle time in it or is it just sort of um, they bless the, the cakes and ale and that's it? We let them do whatever they want to do. So oh, okay. it's an when the goddess forum. shows up, she can change the ritual if she wants. She can sometimes, you know, she might walk around and tell us things. Uh, sometimes she might lead us in an activity. It's always hard uh, to figure out, you know, what she's going to do because it's her time. She can do whatever she wants, or he can do whatever he wants while he's there. Um, if we're doing a public ritual, and every great once in a while we do a public ritual, we'll do a drawing down as a part of the ritual because mm -hmm. we need that extra bit of energy for something, especially at something like Samhain. However, we're usually calling down deities that we know very well, and we might have a conversation with them beforehand about, we want you here, and we want people to be able to interact with you, but we also have to get from part A to part B. Sure. Can you please help us get from part A to part B without like changing the ritual around with a hundred people? <laughs> and usually they're accommodating uh, because we have long established relationships with the deities that we're calling to in such instances. You know, and sometimes you draw down the moon and the goddess or God shows up and it's really fleeting. You know, they're there for 30 seconds or a minute uh, so they might just say hi and then go, or uh, sometimes, you know, I've been there and I could feel them there. And he's just like, tell everybody I said, hello. I just don't really want to be here today. And, and that's it. And then you move on. So what kind of experience you're going to get really varies. And so where are the gods when they're not in you? What are they doing? It's a good god things i guess i you know i mean i, I think <laughs> that they're, a lot of times i feel like they're with me anyways but you but it's but it's not in that way that others can have that physical experience sure. with them and and can the, the gods be in more than one place at the same time can two different covens call the same god and they're and they're and they're essentially there in 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 both places 
I think so. I mean, again, deity is greater than we are. So I assume that it could be in a couple of different places at once. I mean, we look at the ancient world, you know, and there were several shrines, uh, temples to various different deities. Mm -hmm. You know, I think though, I think the gods inhabited all of those places. So yeah, I think very much so they can be in more than one place at the same time. Okay. So, now you defined uh, your um, work as a, you know, magical religion. Um, the majority of people think of magic as being something that is about uh, getting stuff or making stuff change or, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, causing change in the in the universe. So uh, how much does practical magic play a part in your life? We do. We do a great deal of magic. You know, when we have an issue that we want to try to solve, my wife and I, you know, get out the stones and the crystals and the candles and or whatever it is for that magic that we're doing. I think in a greater sense, though, to me, magic is about transformation. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing ritual, I'm casting a circle, I'm creating sacred space, I'm transforming the mundane into something magical. So again, you know, there's magic there just by the act of casting a circle, bringing yeah. in elemental energies, interacting with deity to me is magical. When we have cakes and ale, we're just not sipping wine and eating uh, Twinkies or something. We're infusing those items with energy uh, so we can draw closer to the earth and to the gods. So everything that we do, I think, is magical in a way. But, you know, and to me, and I think to you, magic is not just about getting things. No, not at all. You but, know, yeah, magic I... is about exploring <laughs> ourselves and uh, exploring relationships with higher powers and exploring the earth and transforming things from mundane into something greater than that. I'm just curious, though, because I think a lot of people um, in, uh, in in my my circles of the past and I, and, I, and the witchcraft circles that I've been a little bit a part of, it seems like practical magic plays a much smaller part than it plays in some people who are outside of these communities <laughs> actually use magic more uh, to a certain extent, um, because just because like you said, we're, we're, if you're doing really regular sort of devotional things, it, it, there, there's not that much time to be doing a lot of sort of, you know, spells on your neighbors and so forth. But, um, but, but when you do do that, do you do it in, within sort of a, a, a gardenarian circle or does it have a completely different character when you're doing more practical mundane kind of magic? It depends on what we're doing. You know, I think if something's really serious, we're probably more likely to cast the Gardnerian circle and do something within the context of that tradition. But sometimes it's just my wife and I going into our temple space and putting something together and putting it on the altar or putting something together in our living room and placing it on the fireplace mantle. You know, there's just lots of different ways to do it. And magic also doesn't necessarily always have to be involved either. You know, like if you want somebody to stop parking in front of your house, you know, spit on the tires of their car every time you walk past them and eventually your energy is going to go there and they're going to get the idea and they're going to stop parking in front of your house so it doesn't always have to be the involved sort of things so you, you you've mentioned the word energy a, a bunch of times and i feel like there's there's two different archetypes of the magician that have been um becoming more and more separated in the last uh, i don't know 15 years or so uh maybe even 20 um there's the the magician who kind of causes things through their their wisdom power knowledge and energy and then there's the magician who calls upon their spirits and so forth and and they do the work um so it seems like you probably align a little bit more with that first archetype probably it's probably both i think you know there are times i don't think they're separate through. but people have been separating yeah. <laughs> you know i think there are times we go directly to the gods and then there are times when we're, you know, utilizing our true will and putting our intent out into the universe and putting our energy out and pushing it directly from us. Uh, but to us, I think the gods are so intertwined in what we do that they're probably always there, even sure. when we don't necessarily think of them as actively contributing to something. But often when we do spell work, we're going to invoke the house gods. You know, we're going to invoke Dionysus or Aphrodite or, you know, whoever we think is probably appropriate at that time. Okay. Um, before I wrap this up, I just want to, I want to talk to you a little bit about your new book that's coming out, The, the Horn God of the Witches. Um, you've written a bunch of books um, that, uh, that cover, you know, chunks of things. 
um, and, and your books are, are filled with history and, and wonderful information. So can you give me a sort of a summary of what this one is about? I mean, I, I know what it's about, but you know, the, the, like what, what kind of- No, the, it's, it's really kind of interesting because what, you know, I tried many years ago to write a horn god book and I self-published one and it was mostly just about ancient deities that I thought either had horns or had, you know, lots of phallic imagery. And I thought that was enough for a book. But what in this though, I some of that's still there. I mean, there are chapters on Pan and Kernonos, but I really wanted to talk about how the horn god is honored by witches in the year 2021. So that's really sort of the focus of the book. And you know, it talks about a few ancient deities that have really been influential in creating this sort of bigger idea of the horn god. But then there's literature from the last 200 years, which has also had a very big role in how we see the horned god. Sure. You mentioned Margaret Murray before. Margaret Murray's writings on witches, uh, starting in 1921 with the witch, witch cult in Western Europe were, was really important. James Frazier and the Golden Bough and the idea of sympathetic uh, magic. But also one of the things in the Golden Bough is the idea of a vegetation god that dies and rises annually. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of traditions today, you see the horn god as a sacrifice in the fall for the fertility of the earth. So I wanted to write about that. And then I wanted to write about the god as the god of death. If you read Gerald Gardner's early writings in 54 and 59, he talks about the horned one as being a god of this world, but also a god of the next. And that god of the dead, uh, the Farrars use the term dreadlord of shadows in the witch's bible. I wanted to write about the Dread Lord of Shadows because a lot of times when you read things about the Horn God, it's, oh, he's the God of the forest and the countryside and <laughs> we're all going to go dancing through the green wood together. You know, and it's so, so nice and happy, but there's this other part to the Horn God. To me, that those aspects of death are just as important to his mythos and to, his, to understanding him as, you know, dancing through the woods. So I wanted to incorporate all that in a book do you feel like the 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 male deities kind of get a little bit of short shrift in in um wicca and witchcraft i mean well this is llewellyn's first book about you know the horn god ever <laughs> yeah so, Two, so, 200 but, books in on the goddess <laughs> yeah well i mean i think in a lot of ways though what makes wiccan witchcraft unique is especially you know when you're starting in the 50s and 60s is that emphasis on female deity sure. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, it was it's novel in a way, right? And I know that I got involved in witchcraft because I wanted to worship a goddess. To me, it was important to have the divine feminine. So, yeah, I think that for a long, a long period of time, it was always goddess that was the focus. Right. But I, I think do, that I do is... want to mention that it's only been the last twelve hundred years that it, that, it, that that the goddess has been given short trip. She was definitely <laughs> previous to that quite important. Um, yeah. You know, and she lived, you know, in other ways. I mean, you had St. Bridget, who was the goddess sure. Bridget before that, and Mary. Uh, the Virgin Mary, and, you know, maybe Mary Magdalene and stuff. So, I mean, you know, she kind of continued on in a way. Uh, so, but, you know, but to have her be sort of the center of what you're the doing is yeah. really different in 1951. So, we just never really had a whole lot of God books. And I was told once by a Llewellyn author, Llewellyn or Llewellyn will never print a horned god book, Jason. And they, you know, that person was wrong. But it, I did have to wait seven books <laughs> to, right? to get to that point. <laughs> and so, what what are the other six? Just list them. Uh, the first book I wrote was called The Witch's Athame, which is about matte swords and knives. The mm -hmm. Witch's Book of Shadows, which is you're going to be surprised. It's about books of shadows. About books. Then I co-wrote The Witch's Altar with Laura Tempest Zakroff. And then I stopped writing tool books because I didn't want people to call me tool boy for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I wrote Transformative Witchcraft, which has a huge section on drawing down the moon in it, building the cone of power, the great rite, um, initiations and elevations, and also a lot of Wiccan history in the first section. And then I wrote a seasonal book called The Witch's Book of, or what is it? Uh, there's so many now, they just kind of run together in my head. Um, the Witches, God, I can't remember the name of my own book. That's how muddled my brain is today. The, the earlier there the than year. it is here. So. The, wheel of the, the Witches' Wheel of the Year. Uh, okay. 
rituals for circles, solitaries, and covens, which is my Sabbath book, histories of the Sabbaths, how to do ritual Sabbaths for, you know, solitaries, covens, and large groups. And then I wrote Llewellyn's Little Book of Yule, which is about Yule, and now the Horn God a book. Christmas the next book. tale. What's that? A Christmas tale. <laughs> I love, I love Christmas. I love Yuletide. That's my favorite time of year. So being able to write this little book full of weird Christmas stuff really made me happy. Uh, but of course, I mean, this, but this is my favorite of all the books now. Well, it, it looks it and, looks really interesting, so I, I I'll definitely take a look at it. Um, I will add one more thing though about the Horn God book, if I may. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, while God, researching the want. book, yeah. While researching the book, though, there were representations of Pan as a female Pan in ancient Greece. Mm. There were representation. There's a there are statues of a being who looks very much like Kronos with what the antlers of a stag, but a bosom so a female Kernonos. there are female green men on church walls uh, so the more i think about it you know like the horn god isn't always just a dude either i mean there's another aspect to the horned one um and i think that's important i think it's a way into the mysteries of the horned one if you will you know uh, you see more contemporary deities like ellen of the ways too which is an antlered reindeer goddess mm -hmm. and uh, i think that in a lot of that's addressed in the book too. So it's not just a book for for boys. It's, it's for not everybody. just a book. Uh, it's not just a book for boys. <laughs> it's a book for everybody. I hope, you know. And I think I hope all my books are approachable to everybody. I mean, there's so uh, a lot of different people in the world, and I think they should all be seen within our circles and should feel welcome in our witch circles. And that inclusion is very important to me. So I want to I want to make a couple of quick disclaimers here. Um, first of all. Um, uh, anything that um, Jason has said today is his own opinion and not the opinion of the Gardnerian um, community at large necessarily. Um, I, I, I wanted him to be, you know, free to, to just speak his mind. So I said, please don't, 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 you know, you know, get involved in anything like it. Just tell me how you feel. Um, second of all, I want to say that I don't think that the greater cosmic gods are weaker than, <laughs> than, than the, 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 more earthly gods. I was simply trying to point out that they that they that their influence is more seminal, uh, you know, more beginning things, more starting things, rather than the actual sort of nitty gritty of getting things done. They of course must be stronger because it doesn't make any sense otherwise. Um, but they just don't have as much influence here in in my thoughts. Um, I also want to say that um, the opinion that Sybil Leak and DJ Conway are terrible authors is Jason's opinion, not my own. And I don't want to, any hate mail should go towards him, not me. Uh, <laughs> I, I will say for the record, DJ Conway was a terrific writer. It's just that facts were often lacking in her books. Sure. But she was a really good writer. And Sybil Leak is a really important figure in witchcraft history. <laughs> However, Diary of a Witch not a good book. It's, I think, more of a a piece of fiction than it is a true accounting of gotcha. one's life. Well, I mean, certainly the the four year old anointing sounds a little a little dubious to me, but it's, it, um, yes, it's a great story though. It's a great story. Sure, yeah, it happened to me too. He actually came down from the sky to <laughs> anoint me when I was four. So, um, not to witchcraft though. Uh, that that he left to her. <laughs> yeah, he anointed me into druidism. So, you know, there's also that aspect. We, we've all, I mean, who hasn't been anointed by Alistair Crowley's ghost? Um, very few, I think. So anyway, thank you, Jason, for your time today. And uh, it, was, it was great, great getting to talk to you again. And uh, I'm sure we'll do it again um, sometime in the future. And best of luck with your new book. I'm sure people are going to be buying it. And um, oh, before, before I let you go, I've been asking this of a lot of people lately. If you could give like one piece of advice to a person coming into uh, witchcraft or magic in general, what, what would that be? Read stuff and then use what works and then discard everything else. I think especially when we're doing magic, it's what resonates with you that's really the most important. And I see too many people who are really focused on, well, this writer said to do this and this person said to do that even though it doesn't make any sense to them. So trust that little bit of intuition within yourself, use what works and then dust away the rest of it because you don't need it.